Good evening. I'm Kevin Gosswood, the Chancellor here at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, you to the 8th Abbey Speaker Series event, which is part of our program for public discourse in the College of Arts and Sciences here uh, in Carolina. It's wonderful to see such a great turnout tonight. I think we're in for a real treat. A little bit about the Abbey Lecture Series. Uh, Nancy and Doug Abbey established the Speaker Series uh, to provide opportunities for conversations across differences. Thanks to their generous support, uh, the Speaker Series helps our students think critically about complex issues and thrive as engaged citizens and thoughtful leaders, those thoughtful leaders that we need to strengthen our democratic society. So I want to thank each of you for being here this evening and uh, joining us uh, not only tonight, but in our critical endeavor of promoting democracy, inspiring a culture of respect and advancing democratic values in our community, across North Carolina, and across the world. We've just been through a contentious election period, and given the heightened partisanship that we're seeing, I'm grateful for the program for public discourse for organizing a thoughtful public discussion between two individuals who are on very different sides of the ideological spectrum, yet remain very close friends. And that's what we need more of in society. Mm -hmm. Tonight, it's our honor to have Cal Cunningham and Senator Tom Tillis, former political opponents, together on stage with us to share their unique perspectives. They're going to talk together about the importance of fostering relationships across political, the, the political divide and discuss ways that we can work to improve civil discourse in our country. And I look forward to our discussion this evening and the lessons that we can learn together. At a time when our country needs it most, we're working constructively to promote respectful dialogue and listening here at Carolina. Through our new Ideas and Action curriculum, we're preparing the leaders of tomorrow, right now, here on our campus. Our goal as a university is to provide our students, our faculty, and our staff with the skills they need to be better democratic citizens. Now let me introduce our speakers and our moderator. Senator Tom Tillis was first elected to represent North Carolina in 2014 and is currently serving in his second term after being re-elected in 2020. Senator Tillis is a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, the Veterans Affairs Committee, the Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, and the Judiciary Committee. Before serving in the Senate, he was Speaker of the House in the North Carolina General Assembly, where he played an instrumental role in enacting job-creating policies and reforming North Carolina's tax and regulatory codes. He lives with his wife, Susan, in Huntersville, North Carolina, and they are the proud parents of two children and grandparents of two granddaughters. Kel Cunningham is founder of Cunningham Law, PLLC, where he represents clients in complex civil litigation across North Carolina. He is also manager of Axiom Property Development, where he works to deliver workforce housing in the Triangle. Cal Cunningham obtained his BA with honors and a JD from UNC Chapel Hill and an MS, a, a Master's of Science from the London School of Economics, but it does qualify him as a double target. <laughs> he currently serves as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve and recently completed a fourth active duty tour. He is also a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. In 2020, Cunningham was a Democratic nominee in the United States Senate in North Carolina. I want to welcome both of you to Chapel Hill tonight. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Sarah Truel Robbins. She is a Bowman and Gordon Gray term professor of political science at Carolina. She is currently working on a book project analyzing the rise of inexperienced candidates and anti-establishment rhetoric in congressional elections. She also serves as faculty director for the program for public discourse and as a co-editor for legislative studies quarterly. 
I'm going to thank our Board of Trustees members who are with us this evening, members of the North Carolina General Assembly, former members of Congress, and congressional staffers who are in attendance tonight. And I also want to thank the Program for Public Discourse and the Institute of Politics for sponsoring this event. And now, it's my honor to turn it over to Sarah's role to begin our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Eskowitz. Um, before we begin our conversation, there are some logistical things that I need to go over briefly here for the audience. The goal of today's conversation is really to showcase friendships and conversation across difference. So to that end, I'm asking that if we can remain respectful of the conversation in place and civil and on topic, that would be outstanding. I know all of our students in the room will abide by the agency's honor code and also know the importance of respecting differences in viewpoints. Second, when you arrived, you should have found a blank note card on your seat. Um, if you have a question for our panelists regarding relationships across the aisle or political divides or anything that comes up during the conversation tonight, please feel free to write a question on that note card. We will begin collecting those about 6.15. If you are on the Zoom audience, please write your question online. And finally, I want to extend a personal thank you to Dana Simpson, who I'm not seeing at the moment. Oh, oh, hi, thank you. To Dana Simpson, uh, past chair of the General Alumni Association here at UNC, who really was instrumental in helping make this conversation happen. Okay, so first of all, welcome. Um, Senator Tom Tillis, Cal Cunningham, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you all this evening. Thank you for coming to Chapel Hill. So the two of you ran against each other for the U.S. Senate seat here in North Carolina back in 2020. Um, many of our students in the room were not yet old enough to vote in the 2020 election. So I thought I'd spend just a couple of brief moments kind of talking through, um, giving some background about, you know, that election. So the U.S. Senate election here in 2020 was expensive, it was not known for its civility, and it was close. Um, as the Chancellor said, as of Election Day that year, it was the most expensive Senate election ever in our country's history. It cost $300 million. <laughs> <laughs> it also Oops. saw the most outside money, the most outside money ever in a congressional contest took place in this Senate election in 2020. At the time, Senator Tillis was completing his first um, term in the United States Senate as a representative here in North Carolina, and he went on to win re-election against Cal Cunningham in that campaign. He won by 1.8%. Just to give you a context of that, that um, this last election here on Tuesday between Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley, Ted Budd won by a margin of about 4 percentage points. So this was a really close and heated and at times uncivil campaign. So it's normal during the course of campaigns for there to be missteps, distortions of facts, um, overemphasis of partisan talking points. But before we move on to some of the questions um, about developing relationships and their friendship, I actually want to focus specifically on one of these missteps that occurred during the campaign. And that was a tweet, an infamous tweet by the Cunningham campaign showing Cal in front of a, wait for it, a gas grill Gas grill, a gas grill wearing an apron that said Ambassador for North Carolina Barbecue. Okay, so alongside this picture were a bunch of hot dog buns and some burger buns as well, right? So in an effort to start our conversation off with a little levity and also something I hope we can find general agreement on as North Carolinians, can we agree that grilling with gas is not barbecue. <laughs> so, Cal, Cal, what happened? What happened? No, what happened? And how do you handle something like that during a campaign? God bless my out-of-state staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. God bless them. <laughs> not, not everyone can be privileged to grow up in the barbecue capital of the universe, like in North Carolina, where barbecue is breakfast, lunch, dinner, midnight snack. <laughs> and so we had a teaching opportunity within the campaign. <clears throat> it might have been one of the louder teaching opportunities <laughs> to the campaign. But I can assure you, hickory, oak, pecan, that's how you cook. Lexington 
barbecue. <laughs> and uh, it gave us an opportunity to once again affirm that. <laughs> That's when the campaign took a turn. <laughs> but we saw the picture of that beautiful white starched apron on a gas grill with hot dogs and brioche bun. Yeah. We just said, folks, don't even respond to it, just sit back and watch. <laughs> Tom, you would also, though, agree that your green egg does not constitute some verb of barbecuing, right? Because it's a noun. Right. right, and that's what I tell everybody, you know, in Texas they call it barbecue, it's just not barbecue, it's beef with barbecue on it. And Alaska is barbecue, but it's salmon with barbecue on it. I said, it is a noun. And we do agree on that, common ground right here. Yes. <laughs> one, more bar one more barbecue question that I think we can also agree on, given where in the state you both all are from, western or eastern style? <laughs> so Be I careful, am, there's people yeah. from... <laughs> but I am a true partisan. And I'll tell you tonight what I said in the campaign. I'm from Lexington, and I am proud to be from Lexington. Now, one of the great joys of campaigning in North Carolina, particularly on Sundays, is that you get to visit all sorts of churches. Uh, you get to explore the ecumenicity of our state. Similarly, you get to go to places like Starlight and Wilbur's and these uh, places around the state that do their barbecue differently. You'll love it all, but I'll always be a Lexington partisan. Western? I'm not I mean, I, I, honestly, I, I like the, the fusion of the two. So what I normally do is take the vinegar base with the tomato base and put about a one-third mix of the tomato base and the vinegar base, and that is a true bipartisan solution. Perennial <laughs> <laughs> barbecue debate. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> all right, well, in all, in all seriousness, Cal, despite this barbecue faux pas during the campaign, you actually did emphasize barbecue throughout the campaign. And in fact, I heard someone tell me that at one point during one of the debates, you said to Tom, um, while you were going out on stage, win, lose, draw, whatever happens, let's go out after and, and talk about, you know, the election over barbecue. And How important is it to have something like that, to have a dish, or whether it's a sports team, or um, maybe a favorite music group that can kind of bring you together and give you a shared sense of common interest, especially when there are such stark divides from time to time? Sarah, I mean, there are, it should come as no surprise, I mean, very, very deep disagreements on the most important issues facing our country, uh, women's reproductive rights, uh, dealing with issues like student debt, uh, fighting and combating uh, climate change, uh, things where Tom and I just have very different uh, views and, and priorities. We were about to face each other in the first debate, WREL, if I remember correctly, and we hadn't seen each other in years. In fact, it might have been Tom I think the last time I had seen you was in an airport right around the time that you had been elected to the Senate. Yeah. And so it had been years since I had seen him. He was coming down the hall towards me. He looked a little stressed. And we were about to go out on the debate stage. And so I reached out and said, Tom, win, lose, or draw, the barbecue's on me. He relaxed. I relaxed. We went out. We did the debate. When I called him after the votes were counted, which actually was two years ago today, standing on the beach in Riceville Beach, and I called Tom to concede that he had more votes, and in a democracy that means you win. And I wished him the best as our now senior senator. But I told him then, I said, I meant what I said before we went out on the debate stage, when those are drawn, the barbecue's on me. And I think actually the road to tonight, notwithstanding the differences we may have on the issues uh, stems in part from that conversation and, and yeah. taking me up on the offer. It was two two months later in January. Uh, we met at uh, Big Ed's in Raleigh. It was really funny because at that point, when you have almost $300 million spent, people are going to recognize your face. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they don't, remember, they don't remember all the messages. But but we, uh, we sat down and he had a big bag. We were meeting for breakfast, but he had a big bag uh, barbecue. He says, I know what barbecue is. <laughs> <laughs> and then we went on and we, and we were there. We had a, a, a lady uh, who was serving us and she kept looking at us funny. And then finally she came back up after about 30, 45 minutes. She said, 
are you Tom Tillis, Kevin Cunningham? I said, yes. Um, she said, can I take a picture? I've texted my husband and said that you two are having breakfast, and he says he doesn't believe me. And, uh, that started. Her name was Heather. And uh, there were folks coming out of the kitchen wondering what in the world was causing this. Yes, yeah, two months after People the are election. equally surprised about this event tonight, yeah. I, I must yeah, say, right? Sad. Yeah, it is kind of sad, but true, right? Um, and so that's what I want to move to next. And, and since the time of that Senate campaign in 2020, um, now this whole room knows that whether it was over barbecue and breakfast, but you have developed even more of a friendship, more of a correspondence. Tom, can you tell me a little bit about the development of that? And yeah, well, you know, the... Um, uh, well, first off, I want to go back to the debates, because that, that's really the heat of the moment, right? When, when you're seeing all these ads, 80% of which we have no control over, they're independent expenditures, they can say whatever they can, we can't even legally tell them what they should or should not say. But I think everybody projected that as how we felt about each other. But even during the debates, uh, the first debate uh, at WRAL and the following two, we, we will always meet ahead of time, exchange pleasantries, go beat the tar out of each other for an hour, <laughs> leave the studio and say, oh, all right, man, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, that happened every time. It even happened in the second debate because we had a commercial break. And so after we're you know, going after each other, as you do in, in, in any debates, uh, when we had the commercial break, we were chatting back and forth and, and cutting up with uh, panelists. Is that the one where they wanted to know if we were smoking pot? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's yeah. funny. That, that's, because, they, uh, because they asked the question, have you ever smoked pot? I said, yeah, I grew up in a trailer park. Um, and, then, <laughs> all that. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that everybody did, but when you were a 17 year old living in a trailer park in 1977, most of us did. But, but afterwards, I said, now the cameras are off, guys. You answer. I went down the line for each one. Yes, yes, yes. There's one guy's about my age. I said, Bob? He said, yes, once. <laughs> that was the sort of stuff we were doing. I mean, so that, that gives you a sense that as tense as it may have appeared while we were in the midst of the debate, that's how we were behaving when the cameras were off. Yeah, so when I heard about your correspondence and the fact that you all are still in touch as um, a scholar of American politics, I immediately thought uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And so, if you recall, back in the election of 1800, these two were foes. They were adversaries. They were also great friends. But in that election of 1800, Thomas Jefferson defeats John Adams. They cease corresponding for 12 years. 12 years goes by, over a decade, until they reestablish their friendship. They were adversaries. And this is an important point, I think. Um, and the point for me is that there's a lot of research out there. Um, the person that comes to mind most for me um, is Michael Ignafi um, from he's a Canadian scholar, and he also is a former Canadian politician. And he talks a lot about the difference between adversaries and enemies. And he says that for democracies to work, we need to respect adversaries, right? And understand that an adversary is someone you want to defeat, but an enemy is someone you want to destroy. And we need to understand the difference, right? How are you two able to see each other as adversaries in those moments in the debate, but then move beyond that um, after the fact? Well, Tom might remember the election of 1800. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say this. I mean, part of it is obviously feelings run very, very high. And, and uh, you know, I've worked almost two straight years, night and day, to take the seat that he's holding. And so, obviously, fell short of that. Well, at the time that Tom and I got together over breakfast, we were all still seeing replays of the footage of the Capitol and folks storming the Capitol. And, you know, it's, uh, I think we all know uh, someone broke into the Speaker's house just a few weeks ago and attacked her husband. I think, frankly, part of what drives me, anyway, I won't speak for Tom. Uh, to want to engage is that we have to choose this democracy. We have to want it to work. Uh, we live in, and this is a self-governing uh, country. Uh, we have to affirm the principles and the institutions that make it up. And we can shoot at each other, snipe at each other. I'm sure that our friends are tearing each other up on Twitter right this moment as we speak, but we have to affirm civility with almost a Presbyterian seal. We have to want this, and we have to go out and work for it. And I may not like the election result, 
And you may disagree, but I oh, I like to, I frame it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Right. You mean my election result? <laughs> All right. Now. But uh, but I think we have to I think we have to want it. I think we have to to model what civic uh, discourse looks like. Yeah, and I you know I think the other message I want to make sure gets conveyed here is that I'm not sure it's repeated anywhere else recently that you'd have two opponents that uh, went through what we did very quickly, um, became friends, and, and I've, I've actually reached out to Cal on some matters related to my position on personnel subcommittee for his, his advice because he's very well regarded within the Army. Um, but this happens every day in the Senate. Um, and I can, I can give you a long list of Democrats that we may, and, and frankly, a lot of times, it's, it's not the what, it's the how. I mean, if people really start looking at what we're trying to do, whether we're addressing climate change, whether we're addressing women's reproductive rights, uh, uh, it, it, it has more to do with the how, uh, more to do with the how, the differences and the what. But I, I, it was about, I don't know, maybe about a year ago, that towards the end of last year, that uh, I'm on the banking committee, Sherrod Brown is the chair. Uh, we had a markup for several Fed nominees, and there was a slate of six. There was one that was gonna be the supervisory position for the board. We're in a 50-50 Senate, so you have to get quorum. Quorum requires uh, members from both parties to show up. And Sherrod, we, we told Sherrod Brown, the chairman, uh, senator from Ohio, that we would clear the markup for five nominees, but there was one nominee that we wouldn't clear. And he decided to put them on the, on the agenda that day. We boycotted it. The meeting failed to get a quorum, so his markup failed. I saw him about two hours later on the floor, and he's, he speaks with a real rough voice. He said, tell us, why weren't you check out my committee hearing this morning? I said, I'm, I'm sorry, man, I had a prior commitment. He said, what was a commitment? I said, I committed to Pat Toomey. I was going to boycott your hearing. <laughs> and, 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 and I said, so now that settled. We had a major, anybody that's studying uh, financial matters, LIBOR, which is an indexing mechanism, we had a major transition we had to do. I was working with John Tester. I said, now that that settled, so happened that same moment. Two hours after boycotting the committee, me making a joke of it on the floor, I said, Sharon, sure, now that that's over, we've got to get this done, and we're running out of time. Can you help me? He said, sure, let's go talk to Tester. We're on the floor talking with Tester, and a week later, we got it done. Uh, I could give you a, a, a long list of those experiences that happen every day. So it's not as bad as it looks, but it's not as good as it could be. Whether we're talking about two opponents in a campaign or a diverse group of people on the Senate floor. The campaigning looks bad, though, right? I mean, can we agree that we talk about this enemy or adversary? Yeah. The campaigning looks like you two are enemies, right? When, yeah. we're, when we're seeing the imagery. Um, and so I just want to kind of leave that out there. Yeah. But I really appreciate the legislating um, conversation as well. So I want to turn to something um, that I was struck by in the first debate. And, and Cal, it was you who said, listening is the foundation of leadership in that debate. And that really resonated with me, because here in the program for public discourse, we talk about charitable listening a lot. Um, but unfortunately, it seems so often in politics, and again, what we see might be different than the reality of what's going on, but it seems that more often or not, party leaders aren't listening to the other side. And in fact, what's more common is someone just elevating the discourse and elevating the volume, right? And we hear a lot of loudness. And then the media doesn't help because the media often accentuates that, that noise, right? Those loud voices, if you will. Um, so, Cal, I guess for you, how can we become better listeners? If this is the, the key to leadership, um, how can we be better listeners? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I think I was quoting my Aunt Sis, uh, who bestowed uh, uh, much wisdom on me growing up. She was my uh, the, the aunt that taught me to read. She was an elementary school teacher. And she taught me from a, a young age that a good listener is a good learner. And that stuck with me. So as I have grown up, you know, I was involved in student leadership here at Carolina uh, when I was an undergrad and in law school. I really discovered that, and I think this is amplified just enormously in campaigns, there's a lot of talking at people in politics. Uh, the incentive structures, the media, to your point, uh, uh, sort of 
looks for differences and amplifies them. They're selling ads, campaigns, uh, all the money, all the ads that we were running. We are talking at people. Meanwhile, when I'm out traveling the state and engaging with people, they are actively saying, I want to be heard. I have something to say. And so as a candidate, did a whole lot of Q&A, a whole lot of question and answer, a lot of engagement like this. In fact, it was one of the great joys of campaigning and what made COVID so, so maddening, not being able to travel and do things like this. But I think it, at the heart of it is direct engagement between the elected official or the candidate and the electorate, an invitation uh, into the dialogue, and then active listening. Do you have any words of wisdom? I agree with uh, what Cal said. Uh, turning this in a different direction, that's one of the biggest problems that we have in, in Congress, uh, as members being unwilling to sit down and listen. Uh, I think Congressman McIntyre can probably agree. A lot of people just uh, wait to speak. Uh, they're not listening. They're, they're so focused on what they want to say. They're not instructed by something that may make what they have in mind better or bridge the gap between two parties that are in the room. And, um, you know, we're constantly, I've been involved in a lot of efforts in, in this cycle of bipartisan efforts. And what we what we do as a strategy is make sure we're getting people in the room that are willing to listen, are willing to compromise, and are willing to build something that may not be what they came in with, but enough for them to support, and then for us to get the leadership. I'll tell you the other thing, at, at the end of the day, it's on the individual members. I mean, I, I have an elected leader. We have a minority leader in Mitch McConnell. We have a, uh, a majority leader in, in Chuck Schumer. But it never occurred to me to walk in to either of those leaders' offices to get their approval to pursue something that we believed could get done. Um, they want people to do the work. And if you can do the work and you can get 60 votes or uh, more than they'll move it. So I think a part of what we have to do is just get out of this idea that the leader of a chamber sets the agenda. Um, that's the most important thing that incoming members need to recognize. Especially true in the United States Senate. Yeah. I mean, going back to the campaign context as well, uh, and I think this might be something to sort of challenge each of you in the audience with as well, Folks run for office for very different reasons. And those include, uh, on one hand, folks who really want to kind of get stuff done. I think uh, John Kennedy said uh, some people want to be somebody. They want to see their name in light. Some people want to do some things. And I think as we engage with candidates and elected officials, there are some who are just kind of trying to make a point, who are sort of lobbying bombs, trying to uh, vindicate a position. And there are others who I think are really genuinely rolling up their sleeves and trying to figure out how to govern in a very messy, very cacophonous America. And in order for us to work, you know, in order for this country to work, we need more folks who are willing to try to get things done to solve the problems in front of us rather than the bomb throwers who are trying to make a point. And the incentive system, though, between the media very extreme uh, uh, district drawing, some of the incentives in the fact that uh, we kind of try to run, uh, we play to the base a lot, the fundraising, my God, uh, we get into talking about the negative aspects of money in our politics, really create incentives that pull us in an opposite direction. We got to look, actively look for and elect people who want to govern this country. Yeah, and Congress scholarship, we talk about workhorses and show horses, right? And sometimes you look at Congress today, and I think it's really easy, and again, the media accentuates those voices to see a lot of show horsing, right? And a lot less of the workhorses, which no doubt are there. Um, this is, might be redundant now, but I was struck by something that Senator Howard Baker, the late Republican from Tennessee, once said about this concept of listening. And I'm just going to paraphrase, but he said, in politics, the competition for ideas is fundamental and it is political, but it must be accompanied by a decent respect for the other fellow's point of view. The whole system fails if you don't admit that the other person may be right from time to time. So what's something, Senator, tell us that, that Cal is, is right on? Well, you got barbecue right on. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the, uh, the 
because Cal and I, I, I've come to find out over time that we have a lot of uh, mutual friends. That's why I went back to the uh, uh, to the idea of it's more about the how than the why. Uh, the fact of the matter is, if Cal and I were to sit down and pick on any of these thorny issues, if you know, I've I've been involved in every bipartisan negotiation in the Senate. I'm the only member of the Senate that's been, been involved in every single one of them. Um, and I believe that if Cal were up there, he would be somebody that you could get into a room and say, we, we passed a once in a generation community safety, gun safety bill back in June. Everybody said it couldn't be done. We got it done in 30 days from the first meeting to the time that we passed it out of the Senate. We came in, I mean, it's, it's Chris Murphy from Connecticut, outspoken uh, anti-gun advocate, Kirsten Sinema, myself, and John Corey. And in one hour, I walked out of that room, and my staff is obviously nervous because, you know, when you do bipartisan bills, you're going to take a lot of income. From the right, you're going too far. From the left, you have, it's a waste of time. So we know that we're going to get that. But I went back to my office after that. It was about an hour meeting where we set the parameters of what we were going to work on. I said, I'm convinced we're going to get it done. Um, and I think that, that, that Cal will be the sort of person that you can sit in a room and say, Cal, we're not going to go there. We're going to go here. Are you willing to work on that? you got to find people that have that sort of mindset. Um, and unfortunately, him being in the room and me being in the room would be mutually exclusive. But, uh, <laughs> but I do believe that you need those, you need those sort of people. And, and then you have to uh, lock arms and then commit to whatever you've committed to. We went into that room. We said, if we stay with these, in these bounds, we're there for the duration, no matter what sort of pressure we get. And that's well, we got something done that hadn't been done in 25 years. I would pick up the threads on exactly that piece of legislation, Todd. I commend you for working because I know you, I'm certain you have taken some guff uh, from the right. Uh, if I had been in the seat, I would have leaned probably a little bit further forward. I don't know that you need a 30 round magazine to hunt deer. And if you do, you probably are a really bad shot. But I was vice chair of the Governor's Crime Commission before entering the campaign. And we traveled North Carolina uh, working on school gun violence risks in this state. And we put together a set of comprehensive recommendations uh, for how to make our schools safer and make our communities safer from the risk of gun violence. And those recommendations are in the bill that Tom wrote. And that, I think, you know, uh, I commend you for that. I probably would have gone a little further, but that's the give and take of politics. And uh, and I commend you for, for helping break a long jam on a really important issue. Well, I guarantee you, my friend Chris Murphy would have gone a lot further. But then we were we're constantly looking at if we go here, what brings in a universe of votes that would support it, and what would take it off the rails. And that's exactly why, I mean, Chris Murphy and I haven't worked on any, in fact, we knew each other, but we, had, we just fortuitously uh, were in Kosovo, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina for about a week together, first time we'd ever traveled together, about two months earlier, going back to the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we spent a week together, we became pretty fast friends, we didn't really talk policy, but we had that, that chemistry going in, which is why I could go to Chris and say, Chris, look, it's just not going to happen if you have to go there. And in the same way that, uh, uh, that they told us there were certain provisions that were off the table. So we just quickly, in an hour, I've just never seen that. And Mike, you know how long it takes to get complex stuff done. But for us to get the four corners of, a, of an agreement together in an hour was extraordinary. It's like we're not going to talk about what we talked about when we were on the campaign trail. We're not going to talk about our idealized conception. We're going to talk about something that's going to have a force of law and it's going to get to the president's desk. And it worked. I mean, this this was, I think, a key compromise and it was really neat to witness um, from the outside. So, I mean, for those of you that, that didn't follow this, this summer, this was the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and Senator Tillis did work with a bipartisan group of about 20 senators on that framework and then ended up being one of 15 Republicans, including um, Leader Mitch McConnell, to vote for that legislation. Um, and it did many things that a majority of Americans, a large majority of Americans, find to be lacking um, in public safety, gun safety regulations um, that most people across party lines really agree on. So I think you should be commended for that. I want to touch base on something that you, you briefly talked on um, or spoke about, and that is traveling, right? And so you mentioned getting to know um, Senator Murphy that you said um, in Connecticut that you were working with on this legislation as a part of that working group. 
and the opportunity to travel with him maybe brought you together. Um, this is kind of standard in congressional politics. We call them CODELs. It's short for Congressional Delegation. And what they are is uh, money that is spent for members of Congress to go and learn about um, a place or something that's happening internationally that's relevant to legislation. Um, and will help you know, write better legislation. And so those opportunities to travel with members of the other party, is that helpful in establishing relationships, getting to know people, whether it's over barbecue or over something else on the trip, right? Probably not barbecue, certainly not good North Carolinian barbecue. But is it helpful to get to know people outside of the halls of Congress, outside of the hammering of the legislation? It is, and, and a lot of people need to understand these code, at least the ones that I've been on. There may be other ones that are different, but I mean, uh, I can remember one of the reasons why Chris Murphy and I uh, talked so much is that after we flew over on Milcon, it was a 737, I think, um, then we were transferred to a seven-seat uh, plane with our staff on it, every seat full, including the one that would be a toilet if anybody had the courage to use it because it's right there. Um, but, I mean, we're sitting literally next to each other for a three and a half hour flight uh, as we headed into to Serbia. Uh, and we just, uh, the whole scene was, so it started with humor. I mean, it was just funny how we were all packed in there. It was me, Gene Shaheen, and, and uh, Chris Murphy. And I, I think of an, another code that I did um, with a, a European Parliamentary Summit with a congressional member from Western North Carolina, Democrat, who I actually went to the floor and tore up uh, during because in a Judiciary Committee hearing in the morning, he brought a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and there's this picture on Twitter uh, where he's eating chicken, basically saying that the witnesses are chicken. I, so I went down to the, I told my staff, I said, get it printed on a poster, I'm gonna do a speech in the afternoon, add a picture of him with the thing of Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I said, this is not what we should be doing in Congress. And even worse than that, he didn't have a good sense to buy a box of Bojangles chicken. <laughs> so fast forward, uh, about nine months later, we're on a Codell together. And uh, a company, you were talking about how you find common interests. I, I love music, he loves music. Uh, we ended up, we built a bond that lasts to this day. We're in the, uh, uh, we're on a couple of, uh, in a couple of joint conferences together. But that trip took something where me attacking him in a sentence speech, and I had it ugly, I'm trying to use some humor in it, could have been rooted in never having a good relationship. Now we've got a great relationship where when I see him, I give him a handshake and a hug, yeah. and we'll probably never vote together on any piece of legislation. <laughs> but, but, you know, you, but you do that because you're with them, and you see the human side of them. You know, there's some people that are on 24-7. And I'm not that way, unfortunately, most of the members are. So you get a chance to find out what they like, what music they like, what their families like, and uh, that builds a relationship you need in Congress. Yeah, you both serve in the Assembly, the General Assembly here too, and so at different times, of course. Um, but did you see kind of that type of camaraderie? Because one of the knocks, I would say, on DC culture right now is it really is a come in Tuesday through Thursday club, leave town, families don't move to the district, so everyone's going back home. And of course there's important work to be done back home, but it lessens the opportunities to have those kinds of casual interactions. What was that like in the General Assembly, Cal? So Sarah, uh, I represented, uh, I was a blue island in a sea of red in the part of the state that I was representing in the state senate. I represented Thomas Bull, Lexington, Salisbury, States Bull, Moore's Bull. And I was completely surrounded by Republican representatives and senators. And so when we got together on the regional issues, uh, it was primarily where, uh, when I'm home, if I'm at Mitchell Community College in Morrisville having a little town hall, then I've got the local Republican representative standing beside me. And that forges relationships. We are both engaged in the same audience, talking about the things we're working on in Raleigh. We both represent the same people. Those geographic cross-cutting ties really made a big difference. And then, of course, down you know, there's the banana pudding back in the uh, legislative members' cafeteria, which I think was maybe responsible for about 15 pounds when I was in the state senate. But we would gather back there uh, for lunches before we would come back together in session, Democrats and Republicans, and we would talk about whatever the things were. Uh, that were on our minds, and that helped build relationships. Yeah. So geography and, and a little bit of socializing. Right. 
same thing in the assembly? Yeah, it was. I mean, we uh, I always made it a point to go down for breakfast to the snack bar and then to lunch with the members dining area and, you know, make it a point to sit with the not usual suspects. Uh, I did that when I was uh, uh, in the minority. I did it when I was speaker. And also think just wandering around having chances, not, not make everything agenda-based, but just having chances, discussions, walk down the hallway, knock on the door, see if the member's available, and have those sorts of discussions. Yeah, I think, I think that's great. And in fact, um, here in 2020, Congress sort of recognizing, I think, some of the need for um, establishing relationships, bipartisan relationships in particular, and, and how sort of bad things have got, um, Congress formed a select committee on the modernization of Congress. And part of that was with APSA, the American Political Science Association. And in that report that they put forward, Chairman Tom Graves um, wrote that the survey found that 93% of Americans see incivility as a problem, sort of not surprising. Um, but maybe more surprising is that they really think that it's Congress and the politicians that are to blame. And a lot of this might come back to campaigning, and we can talk more about money and campaigning. Um, but what I think is key is that we often talk about, when we think about civility, and, and you're, you're going to hear a million articles or read articles here recently, like how to go home for Thanksgiving and have a civil conversation with people who think differently than you, how to be polite, how to be pleasant, right? But a lot of this stuff might not change unless our institutions and our elite leaders um, change. And so along those lines, I just want to kind of talk through here some of the recommendations that the committee made. Um, for increasing bipartisanship in Congress and, and bringing back civility. Create a bipartisan members-only space in the Capitol to encourage more collaboration across party lines. It could be the snack bar, the cafeteria, and the General Assembly, it sounds like. Institute bipartisan retreats for members and their families at the start of each Congress. Update committee policies to increase bipartisan learning opportunities for staff. And establish bipartisan committee staff briefings and agenda setting retreats to encourage better policy making and collaboration among members. So, the big thread through all of that is how do we get more people who have different views, whether it's staff or the leaders themselves, how do we get them to interact more casually, even, or hear different messages instead of going to their own individual partisan retreats, right? How do we bring people together? So, Tom, are the recommendations in there that you think? Um, could make a difference? Or yeah, I, yeah, I mean, uh, we can already check the box on the first one. I'm a sponsor, along with uh, Kirsten Cinema, um, that we we have an area dedicated in the uh, in the Capitol uh, on the first floor that's open to Democrats and Republicans. It's a reception area. We bring in food. We have the members contribute. Uh, it's not paid for in taxpayer expense, but it's a room. It's called the Styles Bridges Room. Um, that we I took on Lamar Alexander did it. It, it uh, kind of went a little bit to the wayside, but now when we're doing like voter rama, I don't know if y'all know what voter rama is. That's when we go in and pass a bunch of meaningless stuff that doesn't have to force the law for a 38 hour period. Uh, but during that time, uh, we're there and we want to give people a resting place, and that, that's another area that it, it's just a wonderful mental image. So. You see all these debates that are going on on the floor. You see these really angry people. I can think of shared Brown. And then five minutes later, they're down in the Styles Bridges room and we're joking and having refreshments and having a bite to eat and we go back upstairs. So that one's covered. I think what we need to do uh, that, that's already fits, you don't have to create a new structure. I think our caucuses need to do a better job of meeting regularly. Now, I'm, I'm on the Human Rights Caucus with uh, Senator Chris Coons. We meet pretty regularly. I'm on the Helsinki Commission. We meet pretty regularly. Uh, but there are a lot of caucuses that are designed to get the members together and to get the staff together. And what we probably need to do, your, your schedule gets away from you. There's a lot of preparation even for a, a public caucus meeting. But I, I think if we gen those up more, and developed a discipline, and that, that accomplishes a lot of the, of the other. The problem that you have now, though, is with air travel, uh, the need to be back in your state, with campaigning, it's really difficult to take away that four or five days. And by the way, these folks are humans. They're like me. I got two kids, two grandkids. I want to, if I can be home, I may have to work on the weekend, but I want to see my family. It makes it very difficult to make some of those other ideas that maybe in a time when people lived in D.C. I've only been in D.C. over the weekend, maybe eight times, nine times in the last eight years. Uh, I'm back in the state, not necessarily home the whole weekend. 
So I think that one's the tougher one to cry. But these other ones, structurally, they're there. They just need to be properly executed. Yeah. Okay. This is a good time. I, I have so many questions. I'm not going to get to them all. And of course, we're going to turn it over to audience questions here in a moment. But I do want to go back to the campaign because this dichotomy between what's happening behind closed doors, at the snack bar, in the shared bipartisan space, that all sounds great, right? But often what we, as the American public, see is not that, right? And this goes back to that enemy mindset. What we're seeing on the TV ads, what the money is buying, the independent expenditures, all of that is a picture of the two of you should never be able to sit down together. So we can't solve this here, and you know, there's Citizens United versus the FEC, that's a, a big you know, roadblock to a lot of changes in campaign finance, but how, how should we approach, or how should we think about negative advertising when we see it then? Or, you know, what, what can our students do to really understand that it's not as ugly, or, it's, or how can we make it better than it is right now? Cal? Sarah, a uh, couple of things. First of all, one of the other chairs of the committee that you uh, mm -hmm. referenced uh, is uh, Representative Derek Kilmer from Washington. Uh, his wife, Jennifer, is from Alamance County, North Carolina. He was at Oxford at the same time as the London School of Economics. I followed his career, and he's a real reformer. None of those recommendations, though, touch on what's happening outside uh, the campaign. Right. In the campaign. Yeah. As a candidate, and I let off with this and, and returned to it time and time again, I think we have uh, some real need to heal our institutions and how we run our campaign. I call for returning Citizens United. Uh, that requires a fairly heavy lift, but it is unleashed, unlimited, uh, largely cor corporate funded, independent expenditure work in our campaigns that, as Tom pointed out at the beginning, we have no control over that messaging. And I mean, I had to, as a, uh, a first time candidate in that sort of environment, uh, steal myself of the fact that they just made stuff up it was flat out untrue, and with limited resources, I had to pick and choose whether I elevated it by responding or ignored it and hoped it just became background noise. And I think that that does a tremendous disservice to your ability to judge why we're running and what we intend to do if elected. So I think we've got to do some uh, some meaningful reform. And I, I, regret even thinking that that's a controversial notion. The voices of people ought to be heard inside of those halls of Congress much louder than the very, very, very elite and very well-funded uh, organizations that are pouring a stunning amount of money onto the TV right here in North Carolina in 10 media markets to just bombard you with stuff that often is just not true. Yeah, Sean Whitehouse, uh, serves on Judiciary Committee, uh, Senator from Rhode Island, and uh, you know he's he's given a number of speeches about dark money, and, and uh, I've talked with him. This, this gets to another uh, how, not the what. I mean, I like to get to a point to where the campaign committees control the message and drive and, and, and basically execute budget priorities. So if we're going to be intellectually honest about it, you know, this is a, a brilliant nation that we live in. And if we don't get the how right, then organizations will find other ways to get around it. And it'll just be, it'll be a different flavor of ice cream. So the fact of the matter is, you, you go after all of it. You go after corporate, organized labor. Uh, I mean, up and down the line, they've got these aggregation engines right now, but the, both the Democrats and the Republicans that I think are not the best way to fund campaigns. They've become a different way to send huge sums of money to a campaign from people that don't even know who you are. So if you want to sit down and, and, and get the how right, I'm all over the what. I'd love nothing more than go into a campaign where me and my team got to define everything about our candidate us as a candidate and about our opponent and then stand by the uh, by the validity of, of our assertions uh, i'm not sure we can do it though the bells the bell's been rung it's hard to unring it but but i do think that it would help but I, but there's another thing society has a role in this too there's only so much that 435 members of congress can do most people in north carolina don't know who i am and if they don't know who i am 
They I certainly. Tried. I tried. They, I know. <laughs> well, it took a while. It's tough to go to Lowe's, but uh, but uh, but society has a responsibility in this too. Um, if, if you see a lot of the behaviors driven by the leaders, it's in reaction to something that has surfaced up through social media or through the talking heads at either end of the political spectrum. And I've just asked people, before you press send or tweet or snap, ask yourself, would you sit in front of a room like this and say the same thing with the same sort of tone? Um, so uh, I hope that other people can say, well, what, what can they do? Look into it. I mean, fact check it. Uh, call a campaign office. Uh, do your homework, because we are so quick now to make judgments on 140 words. Uh, and I'll tell you, just to give you an example, this is not a new phenomenon. Back when I was uh, in the legislature, just when I became speaker, I was my own webmaster. I still... Uh, I dealt a lot with technology, so I, I set up my website, I, I did all the replenishing. And about three months into my tenure as speaker, uh, I went from honeymoon period, everybody liked me, they're giving me a chance, we started doing legislation, how to keep white. So I went on my, and, and a lot of this was through social media. And so I went on my website and I created a PDF that was Letter of Resignation. That was in my, that was at TomTillis.com. I went on my Facebook site, which had about 5,000 5, followers, whatever the, the limit is, I think it's 5,000. And I said, friends, I just wanted you to be the first to know, uh, click this link for my letter of resignation. Within about 30 or 45 minutes, the press was blowing up across North Carolina. Speaker Tom Tillis resigned. Speaker announces resignation. If they had clicked on that link, it would have gone to a one paragraph letter that says, I have resigned myself to the fact that people will take, will have assumed what I was saying without even taking the time to make one mouse click and read the first paragraph of this letter. And the press blew up and got mad at me. I said, what are you getting mad at me for? You read a, a one sentence face uh, post on Facebook and you were so lazy and so intent on being the first one to break the story that you didn't even check the source? How am I responsible for that? That's a great story. I mean, that, that really gets My staff said I couldn't do it again. I yeah, to, well, you're going to I wanted to do it about a year ago, but I, I had somebody here. I had to talk off you the have, You have a good staff. Story. You have a good staff. Um, but the, the social media environment, right, when we think about the discourse and the incivility that's out there, um, so many people aren't even dealing with the same set of facts, right? It's a like, compounded problem in the social media environment and the unique environment where everyone is you know, sorting out their own media. Um, and so that makes it really challenging to listen carefully and to do the things that we're trying to keep engaged. I have two kind of really quick things, and then I want to turn it over to audience questions. Um, and this has to do with some of the deterioration of maybe the respect for Congress or where civility is breaking down. And again, as a congressional scholar, one thing I study, and the chancellor alluded to this, is inexperienced candidates um, running for Congress. And not just that they're being successful in campaigns, I mean, voters should vote for whoever they want to, but what are the ramifications of that for the institution, right? For both representation of constituents when you get to Congress and also legislating once there. And I, I think about you, um, Tom, because you mentioned this in your intro, and you, you said you grew up in a trailer. You moved a lot. You talk a lot about your background. You talk about your business career. You talk about you know, then going to the General Assembly. Um, we all know the story that you want to get a bike path in your hometown. That's how you got involved in politics. Um, and so then you, know, you become a speaker of the General Assembly, and then you move on to the Senate. You had legislative experience when you got there. That's not true of a lot of people coming into Congress today um, on both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats alike. What are the consequences? Do you think there are consequences to them not knowing kind of what to do in Congress? Is that a problem um, but, you know, for the institution? A lot of the people that come there are very smart, but their, their, their work experience may or may not be adapted. I, I was a partner at Price Waterhouse, I admit it, back in 1996. So my entire career was about methods, practice, practices, methodologies. So fortunately, I had that going into the legislature. But we do have now, we have people that come from different backgrounds that may not have had really the experience of conflict management. Uh, you know, you'll have a CEO come in, it could be the, the first time that they've been in a political position, they find out they're no longer CEO, they're one of 100 people that can vote however the heck they want to, they find it very frustrating. Uh, but some of them dig in and do great work and legislate. 
Uh, others just are waiting to be CEO. Ain't ever going to happen. Uh, and so I think that uh, it, it, it's more a matter of, of if, if you don't have that experience, understand what you don't know, and then get really good staff. And that would be the key thing. I've got some staff here um, in the audience. The key thing is hiring good, experienced people that understand policy, understand the inner workings of the uh, of the institution, have relationships with other offices, and that can accelerate things very quickly. Yeah, no, that's great. Okay. So, yeah, I, you can follow up on that. The one question I really want to ask you too, I think, is the role of primary elections and a lot of the lack of stability we see today. And primary elections for Congress now are kind of where a lot of the action is, right? As districts have been drawn to be safe for one party or the other. And, you know, Cal, you had two primary elections trying to get into the general election for a Senate. Um, the first one unsuccessful, the second one successful. But one of the things and strategies you had to use with that political action committees on the other side were trying to get your opponent in the Democratic Party elected, right? And this is a strategy both parties are increasingly using. We just, we just saw it in all the elections here this fall. So what role are, are primary elections kind of playing in this as well? Um, this lack of stability or you know, deterioration of the institution, those kinds of factors. But you're also welcome to answer the question. Sure, no, I've got a good story on the first one, but I'll okay. talk about primaries first real quick. I mean, obviously, the, the objective was to take the seat that, that Tom was holding, and the only way to accomplish that was to, um, you know, very authentically communicate my values directly to the electorate in the highest scale I possibly could. I, I knew it was going to be a large turnout. We had a very fractious presidential primary at the time. Uh, the other Democrats who were asking for the vote in that Senate primary were really good people. Uh, and so rather than engage them, uh, and I did, I tried hard to just stay focused on the broader electorate. Now that's not always a successful strategy there. Uh, I was asked to uh, pledge my support to uh, ideas and causes that uh, still to this moment mystify me, quite frankly. Uh, and that's after having tried to study them uh, in great detail. I, a little bit of the how and, and, the, and the, the objective uh, conversation, we rarely would disagree within the Democratic primary about our, for instance, belief that uh, healthcare is a human right and that we needed to do more to make sure that everybody had uh, universal healthcare. The question was how do we achieve that? And within the primary, there were some very strong views about how we achieve that. So uh, I worked hard just to be authentic, communicate how I thought we could actually solve the problems, uh, and then do what a candidate has to do to build political and financial support to run a campaign in a very, very large state like North Carolina. I would love to go back, though, yeah, please do. real quick, then then we'll a, mess, a message yeah. to the young people. I was elected to the state senate, I think I was, uh, I just turned 27, so I was the youngest state senator in many, many years. It's still, maybe still true, but uh, I don't know that there's anybody that age. And when I first went to the first Democratic caucus meeting, there was a salty old uh, member named R.C. Souls from Tabor City, who was the, quote, permanent chairman of the, uh, of the Democratic caucus. And R.C. said, I want to put this in perspective. He said, I was serving in the legislature for six years before this kid was born. And I got up and I said, well, R.C., I'm not going to hold your age against you if you don't hold mine against me. And he rocked back on his heels. And from that moment, for the entire time I was in the state senate, what I found was that as a young person, being conscientious, studying the issues, reading the bills, being inquisitive, trying hard to engage substantively, made me a good legislator. The age, the experience base that I brought in was so much less important than a willingness to really dig in and try to govern the state. And I would hope that each of you here, that you don't have to wait for somebody to tell you to step up and own this democracy, because it's yours and your voice is critical in it, whether that's running for office or engaging with candidates. Uh, you really have a key role to play now in making it what it ought to be. Yeah, I will say that um, in 2014, uh, the then uh, Democratic leader, uh, uh, through his super PAC, spent about $8 million trying to defeat me in the primary. Mm -hmm. um, and Colorado, in this cycle, uh, uh, 
Leader Schumer's Associated Super PAC spent about, about the same amount, about $8 million, defeating the person who got the primary, uh, ended up getting the primary nomination. He actually bypassed the Republican Party and uh, went straight to a, a run with the, the, uh, the party nominee. That's where I'm all over the idea of the what being, the way the money's being spent. Um, because we are going to see a, a reduction in the quality of the best candidate coming out of primaries to the extent that the other parties now are consistently playing in those primaries. And uh, you know, in my case, it, uh, that we had a, it was an eight-way primary, so it was probably based on the law, uh, a good strategy on their part, but it's a bad strategy for really getting the best person, best prepared, most responsive to the broader electorate that you have to serve. When you get elected, you serve Democrats and Republicans and unaffiliated and everybody in between. Um, and I think that it would produce better candidate, better better manager for the constituents. An excellent point. Like primary elections in North Carolina, this most recent one just saw twenty percent turnout, right? We're talking about a small group of people who are then making these decisions. And more um, registered voters in North Carolina are registered as unaffiliated than either the Republicans or the Democrats, right? And so how to target them it becomes an important question. Okay, without further ado, um, again, I can talk all night, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time here, but I'd like to turn it over to questions from the audience. Um, I'm sure we have plenty. It's on. All right. So first question, clearly not from me, but not to very Generation Z. How do you help show Generation Z that we all have that we all have agreements when we have such strong opinions? We don't always have the option to go to these events. We should <laughs> go to these events. Well, right. well I was going to say it's okay that we have disagreements on the issues. Uh, it is part of who we are as a country to have this. I mean. So he was born in the trailer park. I was born in the trailer park. He was a short order guy. I was the fry guy at McDonald's. We've come to very different conclusions about raising the minimum wage, and that's okay. Um, our life experiences can inform, and does inform, do inform us in very different ways on the issues, and it's okay to we disagree on it. What I think we need to do to this point is we've got to find ways to actively affirm that we all have a voice and that we all have a role to play in making this country and this state and our communities better places. And this is one way to do it. Engaging with folks on the hall where you live is one way to do it. Uh, being involved in campaigns, running for office, those are all ways to do it. Uh, we did start, I think, with a personal commitment to affirm uh, these very basic values and norms that make our country such an amazing place. I think Gen Z's got a, a greater challenge than I had. You know, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't get a cell phone until I was about 30 years old. It was actually about 28 years old. It was one of those that mounted in the car, a big, uh, a big brick. Uh, but you have so many temptations to find yourself in a bubble and to communicate with people who think like you. And you need to resist those temptations from time to time. Um, and you need to find a way to do exactly what we were saying. Listen. Uh, get, you know, I, some of my most enjoyable conversations in the Senate are with members on the other side of the aisle. Uh, and then every once in a while, it, it, it takes root in the form of something we think we can get done together. But I, I do think that for a variety of reasons, there are so many... Uh, temptations to only uh, to, to really reject otherness in the terms of ideas, in terms of backgrounds, and to only really communicate, connect with, and discuss matters <coughs> with people that you already know are on the same page. And I just don't think that that's healthy. It's certainly not healthy for future leaders, but I also don't think it's healthy for society as a whole. That's great. Yeah. All right. This is actually related. How do we combat social media misinformation, disinformation, and echo chambers? Well, we'll see how Elon works that out with Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, is Twitter going bankrupt yet? Just checking. 
you know, the, uh, we've got to come up with a technology. This is the subject that we're, we're, uh, we're discussing in, uh, in judiciary. Uh, and a part of what we're talking about uh, has to do with uh, what's referred to as Section 230. The, the world is very, very different today. And we're having a discussion about how do we hold the platform provider who is profiting uh, through the propagation of these platforms when what they're allowing to be moderated is completely off base. Um, and it's a very sticky issue because you wade very quickly into uh, free speech uh, challenges. But when you have these institutions now that are worth billions of dollars um, and you see the threat not only to people being misinformed, but allowing state actors to come in there. This is a national security challenge as much as, much as it is a domestic discourse or domestic uh, security challenge. And it's something that Congress will probably have to weigh into unless we see, you know, I've said to Google, uh, Facebook, uh, to Dorsey at the time when he was CEO of Twitter, the best solution is an industry-led solution because if we do it, we can overreach or make a mistake. But the industry needs to get together and they need to come up with something far better than what we've seen over the past eight or 10 years. Cal, any tips on social media? Well, I mean, look, it's, I think the social media, this conversation is also part and parcel of a real breakdown in, uh, in affirmation of institutions uh, in society that uh, our trust in governance, our trust in each other uh, is at an all time low. And I think each of us owns that. Uh, we have to really affirm, each of us has to affirm uh, an, an intent to be civil. Uh, the, the moderators and the uh, fact checkers, uh, you know, they, those institutions, folks don't have confidence in those institutions. And so I think it really starts at the end, it has to start at the individual level. And I do think the industry has an, an important role in trying to figure out how to regulate itself. But until that day, uh, folks, uh, in, you know, we each decide whether or not we are going to be civil and engage with each other. And we can all, I think, uh, go with a little bit of humility back to Senator Baker's point that others may have views that, while different than ours, may have some validity. Yeah, they might be right, right? I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, another question, please. Do you think polarization is a myth? Yeah. It's probably all that lots of voters are they really as polarized as we hear on Fair enough, Mark. Um, you know, the reality is it's about 15% at the far end of the left and 15% at the far end of the right that are hopelessly polarized. And, and you have to just accept that. Um, I think most of the people in the middle, I think even the results of the election this week have proven that uh, uh, the electorate doesn't like how Republicans or Democrats are behaving right now. And I think if we're moving into divided government, we have an opportunity over the next two years to produce results we need to because we're going to have a tough time economically, I believe. We're going to have an ongoing crisis in Ukraine. Um, but I, I think it's the amplification of the voices at either end of the spectrum is the polarization that most people are talking about. Most of the time, when I'm, you know, in, in public, people will come up, they may not agree with me, but I can have a cordial conversation. About once every six weeks, I have somebody get up in my face, uh, and the, we don't have a very pleasant conversation. Um, but, uh, but, but you can see uh, that that person is so ideologically driven or so convinced that they're right that they're not even willing to have a conversation about. I had this back in June. I'm in the midst of negotiating the, the, the community safety bill, the gun safety community safety bill. I was a week into it. And I was accosted by a person at a Lowe's. I was actually returning toilet bowels that I didn't need. I was doing some home improvement at my house. And I'm, in the, I'm in the return line. This guy came up to me and he just read me the riot. And I said, sir, you, you obviously know who I am. Um, do you understand that I'm in the middle of trying to get uh, a once-in-a-generation community safety bill passed with Democrat members? I mean, do, do you understand that he'd come in so prepared to judge me without even having done the homework that we were in the middle of a 30-day process that produced an outcome? That person is lost forever, in my opinion, 
because they've proven to me they don't want to do the homework and they're not interested in the fact. He was clearly not interested in having a discussion about it. And at that point, most of the provisions were made. Uh, I think those folks are hopeless until they recognize that they're, they're low. That was not a productive discussion for them. And two weeks later, he had to read the news that, uh, that we were successful with passing the bill. But uh, I would have loved to have that person say, I disagree with you, I hate everything you do, but would you consider this? Uh, and, and maybe I would have, but he never gave me a chance to actually engage in any sort of meaningful discourse. And it was always not like I felt like he was pressing send on a tweet and didn't realize I was standing right in front of him. Which is why I was surprised when I retweeted back to him on my opinion of this and I, and I think there are some institutional contributors here too. Media is selling ads, and so they are looking for ways to amplify the most extreme voices in society. It agitates you and me, and that helps drive eyeballs and, and viewership. Similarly, when we have these incredibly lopsided legislative districts that will only elect a person from the extremes of one party or the other, it makes it incredibly difficult to have those engaging conversations and the inquisitiveness and the listening that really is necessary because the incentives are, uh, you know, I'll get reelected if I harp on him or he'll get reelected if he harps on me. And to give a little bit of perspective on this, uh, in 1992, when Bill Clinton was running for president the first time, about 20% of the electorate indicated that it was open to persuasion, that he was listening to the debate and was willing to change uh, his votes based on that. When Tom and I entered this race against each other, about 4% of the electorate was saying that it was open to persuasion. Now, as a candidate, all the incentives are then for me to communicate to Democrats and Democrat-leaning voters to amp them up as much as possible and then get them to the polls. Similarly, I don't, I can only imagine the strategy inside your operation. Uh, his uh, goal, when the electorate is saying, we've already decided, we're gonna either be red team or we're gonna be blue team. We're, you're either with Trump or you're against Trump. And these sort of very, very calcified lines um, I think we all, as citizens, have to be ready to open our minds to what the candidates have to say uh, as well, because we have become, the polarization is very real under those circumstances. That's great, thank you. Another question, please. What would be good strategies to get fellow legislators on board to achieve bipartisan bills? It's all transactional. Uh, and you know, I'm trying to tell everybody, you know, it's inherently undemocratic for us to be one big happy kumbaya uh, you know, group of 100 people. We, we have our ideological worldviews, and we should always advocate for them. Um, but there are a number of opportunities for what I can call transactional bipartisanship. I've been involved in a lot of them in this Congress. And I think that if we had more members focus on that, and, and look, you need to understand, if you're going to be on a bipartisan game, you're going to take as much heat from your party as, as really that's where the heat comes from. A little bit from maybe the far left that says you're not going far enough, but we have to have members have confidence in the quality of the policy so that it ages well, so that by the time they run for re-election, if they choose to run for re-election, you can say, this is why we did it, this is the positive result, this is why you should vote for me. But there are a lot of members that are, are just uh, a little bit more worried about positioning for the next election. And, and look, I get it. If you're a year out, maybe you don't get in a bipartisan game. But if you just got elected in this class and you've got six years and you're not working on bipartisan legislation next year, then why are you here? Great point. Yeah. Great. That goes back to my point about why do folks run for office. There are some who really want to see their name in lights, and there are some folks who want to try to govern very, very difficult uh, job of governing this messy and cacophonous country. And likewise, the media accentuating certain voices sometimes over others, right, is, is part of this um, problem too. Yeah. Related, where do you see the most promise for bipartisan progress next year? Well, I, uh, I think in the Senate, since the number's going to be probably 50-50, 51-50, and we're going to have a divided Congress with the uh, 
Republican uh, majority in the House. A lot of it depends upon how well they come together. Uh, we can well, we can continue to do work, but uh, there's going to be challenges with the thin margins. Um, and as I said earlier, I think it is more likely than not it's going to fall on the Senate to really source a lot of the bipartisan negotiated bills. So then it, I, I find it unlikely that given the narrow margins you're going to have in the House, that you're going to see a fertile ground for a bipartisan gain getting the votes. So that means that we've got to do the work. We have to do the legwork, not only getting the support from the Senate members, but also to reach out to House members and our respective parties, shop what we're doing, and see if we can pre whip something that we may be able to get 60 or 65 votes, uh, pre whip it, and have our negotiations instructed by how well it will be received by a Speaker of the House and a minority leader that'd be willing to put it on the floor. But uh, so I think in this Congress, if it's 50 50, 51 50, or 51 49, whichever direction it goes, it's going to rest on the Senate to be the ones to push anything that I would consider to be rising to the level of some of the stuff that got done in this Congress. What advice would you have for young people interested in getting into politics? Uh, number one, uh, get some business experience first. And whatever your study, uh, get some real world experience in whatever your field of study is. Get involved early. Uh, but uh, again, uh, it, I, I think that it is challenging for somebody who has no legislative experience to go, go to Congress, but it's equally challenging if that's all the experience they've had since they got out of school. Uh, because that real world experience is critically important. Um, I, I encourage people to, I, I love, I, I was started as partner at Price Waterhouse. We became uh, uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers, but that that work I mean, encouraged. In fact, some of my staff have gone on to work for some of the big four firms. I said, go out, if, even if you love public policy, go out and get some real world experience so you can have a better understanding of the decisions we're making and its impact on businesses, on society. Uh, but get involved early. I did. Uh, uh, I did start in politics. In fact, if it weren't for me being an avid mountain biker, I, I may have never gotten into politics because my first foray into politics was in like 2000, where I, I made a proposal for an environmentally sustainable single track mountain bike trail on a piece of property that I found out that the county owned. Um, and that got me on the Park and Rec Advisory Board. It is a lot like Park and Rec show, <laughs> by the way. Um, and then. Uh, uh, and then that led me to get in the, on the town commission and run for the legislature. Seven years later, the Mount Mike Trail got built after uh, I was in the legislature for two terms. But that experience opened my eyes. And I think it did. Uh, being a town commissioner, uh, being a legislator, even being on park and rec advisory board. So finish your degree. Get some business experience. Uh, Wet your appetite for public policy by volunteering on boards in the county, the city, state, uh, whatever level, to get better ingrained in your mind the decision making, the democratic process, and I think it sets you up to be a better legislator. Yeah. What about you, Cal? Well, so I uh, am a very proud uh, uh, double degree holder from Carolina, and when I was an undergraduate, I was studying American political science in the poli sci department with uh, Dick Richardson and. European politics with Jörg Steiner, and I was uh, studying directional theory on voting with uh, Stu McDonald and George Rabinowitz, and uh, and you know studying political philosophy. Went to law school to, to really study law. I think if I had known though that 25 years later I was going to be a candidate for the United States Senate in North Carolina, the most expensive U.S. Senate race in the history of the country, I instead would have been studying traumatic brain injury, <laughs> and, or or maybe doing two a days with Mac Brown out on the uh, the football field. Uh, I say that in jest. There is really uh, nothing more important at this stage to you studying and understanding the institutions of, of, uh, of our country. Uh, and, you know, I was engaged in uh, student government, I uh, was student body president, and when I was in law school, I was the, uh, the chief justice of the student Supreme Court. Those early experiences 
uh, in how to lead, how to engage. Uh, the early study in Carolina really created a great foundation for a public spirit and a public service zeal that has been a part of uh, my adult life. It's part of why I joined the military after September 11th. It's part of why I stepped up and ran for the state senate at a young age. This, you know, this democracy is yours. Uh, we all own this together collectively, and each of us has a role. It may not be a run for office, uh, but we all should be engaged because if we're not, uh, folks who are just trying to make a point rather than trying to govern are the folks who are going to end up in, in office. So I encourage you to take ownership if you haven't already. Great. Do we have time for one more? Yeah, this is going to be our last question. I just want to give the audience a heads up that after the panel is done, we're going to let the panel leave before we all leave. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the panel has mentioned getting into a room and saying things that you wouldn't say in a campaign. How can we start getting real in campaign rhetoric, or how can we make campaign rhetoric more genuine? Well, you know, I was thinking if, if you go if you go on uh, YouTube and you look up uh, uh, Adams Jefferson presidential uh, they campaign, back then. campaign. What they what they've done though is they've taken the handbills and the posters that were out there at the time, and they've produced if if they had social media at the time thirty second spots about what John Adams said about Thomas Jefferson and vice versa. It was people have asked me. When did politics get nasty? I said, just after George Washington left office. <laughs> so number one, keep in mind, this isn't a, a brand new phenomenon. And if you go out there, it's hysterical. It's got a 30 second spot, it's pretty easy to look up on YouTube. Um, again, I, I, I think that we as, uh, as a leaders can only do so much. Everybody needs to think about their own personal behavior and how it aggregates societal behaviors. I think it's critically important. The other thing I, I didn't want to touch on, I didn't know if we'd get a question, but uh, I was the last member of the Senate to lead the chamber on January the 6th. And there are a lot of people who said democracy is at risk. Democracy's always been at risk. It's been at risk since we signed the Constitution, uh, our democracy. But what I will tell you I take away from that day is the institutions withstood one of the greatest stress tests in our history. We stayed in the building. We returned to the floor. I, along with a majority of the members, <laughs> voted to certify the election. We did not yield. The institutions were challenged. But at the end of the day, on the day that we were appointed to do our job, that job got done. And so I, I think I, I want you to walk away because if, if we talk about how you change your attitude, uh, think about the, the pride that comes from the fact that the Capitol was destroyed. People lost their lives. We were all being threatened. Um, but at the end of the day, we finished our job in that legislative session. That says a lot about the strength of our democracy. We can never take it for granted. We have to hold every single person accountable for the despicable acts on January the 6th. But this 200-year-old-plus institution withstood that challenge, and that's something that we should all be proud of. Hate what happened on January 6th, but proud of what ultimately happened at the end of that legislative day. Yeah. Any good thoughts? And look, I mean, I would say that we need to do things exactly like this. And at a time when there's a lot of incentive in society to amplify polarization, uh, having an institution like Chapel Hill uh, and for a mutual friend, and Sarah, what you're doing, uh, work to bring together folks who uh, have very different views, but who believe uh, uh, in uh, civic engagement. I think you know, an institution like Chapel Hill has an important role to play. Tom and I talked a little bit about where do we do something like this? We thought we did it on TV. 
through the short form sniping at each other. The, the incentives to, to get cute with each other would be too great. A podcast that one would listen to. You know, where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we did it on Twitter, of course, nothing good would come of that. But, uh, but I think that the, when we think about the institutions that in society, I think uh, the academy has an important role to play. Uh, forums like this can have an important role to play. Uh, and so thank you for doing it. Well, I think that's right. And I think it's especially wonderful that you came to chapel to do this. Um, this is a place that is the school for North Carolina. And I take great pride in teaching American politics here because our students come from all 100 counties. Our students come from not only Bergen Lake, but they also come from Burke and, and Davis. And Davis, sure. Um, and Iredell and everywhere in between, right? And we have such diversity here, and I think having the two of you come to showcase that diversity for our diverse student body, um, and to show that viewpoints can differ, but we can still listen, and we can still respect, and we can still go out for barbecue, um, that's the goal here at Chapel Hill. And so I can't be more happy to leave the program for public discourse to have the two of you join us. If I could ask the audience to please give our guests a round of applause. Wonderful audience. Um, it was absolutely a pleasure to be here. Appreciate you.